Alrighty, um, we've waited long enough uh, for folks, so we might as well get started. So I hope everyone could hear me loud and clear. Uh, let me go share my deck really quick. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi, hello, hello. Um, I'm gonna go share my screen in a second. Do, 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 do. Oh, everyone see it, see it? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so yeah, uh, agenda uh, today. Um, so um, we'll do some introductions. Uh, then we'll have some community presentations about 15 minutes each uh, from the uh, Gremlin and Chaos Toolkit communities. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the status of where we are at the landscape, mostly me um, asking help from everyone and trying to come up with some reasonable categories on how to categorize the different technologies in, in chaos engineering. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about the white paper uh, based on community feedback. I uploaded a cut to GitHub so we could uh, bang away at it uh, via pull request instead of uh, Google Docs, which seems to be favorable to a lot of folks. And then we'll kind of end things um, out. But first off, um, it would be great if we could get some introductions from folks, especially if you're uh, new on the call. So any new faces from, from last time want to speak up and say, say hello. Cool. I'll go ahead. My name is Ryan Keane. I'm up in Seattle. I'm, I'm uh, working on an early stage startup up here called Fuzzbox that um, runs uh, failure simulations on your production artifacts. So very chaos adjacent. So that's why I'm here and interested. So thanks. Cool. Very, very cool. Hmm. Anyone else? Uh, yes. Uh, hello. My name is uh, Alexey Ledinev. Uh, first time joining this call. I work on uh, Open source project Pumba is cows testing for Docker containers. Okay. Awesome. Glad to have you. Anyone else? Anyone else new? Yeah, I can go. Uh, hi, my name is Julian. I'm currently in uh, Stockholm in Sweden and I'm a software engineer. I'm doing a lot of Kubernetes and Docker work these days. And I'm really interested into uh, chaos testing and especially the continuous, continuously testing production environments. Cool. Awesome. Anyone else? All right. Um, that will be interest for this time. We'll try to make sure everyone has a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, that is new every time. All right, let's go move on. So, like your presenting mode again. So, uh, landscape. So, um, one of the few things that we wanted to accomplish, um, you know, from the working group is to kind of produce uh, not only um, a list of kind of the different chaos engineering projects and uh, products and tools out there, but also attempt to categorize them. And, um, you know, I've been bashing my head a little bit uh, working with Sylvain and some others to kind of come up with an initial idea but I would love um, to hear from the group uh, if anyone has an idea in terms of uh, you know how to categorize things so whether you could you know the simple things you could categorize by like hosted solutions versus you know uh, maybe frameworks um, you know that run um, you know client side and our driven client side um, versus maybe chaos engineering tools that are focused on security. So having an idea of how to categorize this thing is definitely um, something I've been trying to, to tackle. So um, I'm asking folks, uh, we could have a, we could have a probably like a five minute discussion um, on the call today, but there's a GitHub issue open. And um, if you kind of have ideas of, of how to kind of categorize things, um, it would be great to hear because that's essentially going to drive uh, the landscape that will be produced by uh, CNCF for this, uh, for this work. So uh, I don't know if anyone wants to take um, a stab at this. I know Sylvain, uh, you had some thoughts that we chatted over email, but I'd kind of love to hear from the group if they've, um, you know, got a picture <clears throat> in their mind um, of how this uh, should be categorized. I've got a, actually a quick question, Chris. Sure. Um, yep. um, how did that work for other, you know, working groups like serverless or anything? Did they go through the angle of the market of the the tooling? You know, what was the rationale for 
It, uh, well, I mean, it was a lot of bike shedding for ever to come up, kind of come up with the categories. I mean, at first, first we started with a list of serverless projects and right. things, right? Uh, and then from there, we tried to break it up in terms of categories mm -hmm. um, and kind of what makes sense. So that's kind of the approach we took. It took a long time. Um, you know, and I was trying to use that framework to apply to chaos engineering because, you know, obviously there's, uh, seems like there's an upstart of, of kind of hosted offerings, you know, you know, with Fuzzbox, Gremlin, um, KSQ, et cetera. And then there's a bunch of kind of tools that have different focuses on whether they're trying to do um, chaos engineering in a, uh, what's it called? Um, security context or, or uh, you know, uh, some other context, so. So, you know, I'm, I'm just asking how to, how to categorize things from like, what are people's mm -hmm. thoughts on, on this? Yeah, I, I have some sense that, that focusing on the context, like, like whether it's security or something like that may not be the right way, even though it seems like it might to begin with. Yeah. Um, just, just cause I, I, I think, yeah, I, I think like reading the chaos book and stuff, like coming at it from the perspective of like either running experiments or I, I think Julian mentioned, but like continuously running, um, ex, you know, r running tests and that kind of thing is, is maybe more of the the, the way to um, dissect it. Because so, I think at, at some point you get into a concept of, yeah. like, of like dark debt and things like this, where it maybe isn't necessarily applicable to very clear clear domain. So, you know, okay. I think more and more ways of applying chaos, like, like by, by its very nature, Chaos yeah. is chaotic, therefore not um, cat no. cat easily categorized. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we could just start with like one big box and just call it, you know, chaos, you know, engineering, and just throw everything in there in one box. But um, yeah, I, I also like you know, there, there's some. You could maybe even say like whether it's actually in production whether it's like you know how um netflix do it with sort of canarying and you know almost how it gets applied versus what it's being applied to i guess is what i was poorly trying to say um, okay. so whether it's you know like what what i might do which is, is like run on like a snapshot of the artifacts almost like like in a staging environment whether it's actually you know you have like the gremlin agent deployed and you're, and you're running that on production with a blast radius or whether you know you're actually just setting something loose like chaos, chaos monkey it's almost like what's the What's okay. the scope of how you're applying it? Might be a way to break it up because because I think there's yeah, th there's there's different stages in sophistication to where you apply each of those, and that that might be a way to kind of step okay. through the tools. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think there's a case to be made. Here's the technology, and here's the philosophy, and okay. the philosophy might be a great place to start. And then the technology is it Docker? Is it Kubernetes? Is it yeah. bare metal? Is it whatever? Yeah. Yeah. For, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I'd also ask people to have some like, you know, empathetic thoughts from like an end user perspective. If you're trying to like evaluate what tools out there and like, hey, I want this to stuff to work against AWS or, or Kubernetes, yeah. you know, making it easy for them to find that, at least from that perspective, is super useful. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd like us to also make sure that's somehow possible from like a, just an end user <coughs> perspective. That's a great point. I, you know, how do you get started? I, you know, I, I've been told I have to do this thing at work. So where do I even begin? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and I'm running on Azure or something. I want to make sure this stuff works there too. So yep. that type of perspective. Um, Does the landscape, this. you know, uh, application has uh, several dimensions when you can filter, yep. you know, things on, on, on different diverse, you know, degrees of or refinement or something like that. Yeah, there could be multiple kind of accesses of, of, of filtering. Um, you know, I'm not asking for like a complete, you know, solution, but uh, for folks to kind of uh, put their thoughts on that GitHub issue and for us to kind of keep iterating um, on this. Eventually, I kind of want to get to a state where we have kind of a rough uh, agreement and then I could work with our design team to start sketching out um, how this is going to look and then we could kind of continue to iterate um, uh, on that. If I may, um, yep. I've been maintaining a Docker repository for that's called Awesome Docker. Yes. I've been basically doing that for like four years. And I can tell you the pain of trying to categorize a landscape that is shifting under your feet all the time. Yep. So the with the other contributor, what we came out, the, the main idea was we, we split everything into use cases. So who who is it for? 
not what does it do, like who is it for? And from there, mm -hmm. most people find like the common terminology and, and can uh, relate to keywords much easier and find a way and contribute to the list as well. So that's, that's a yeah. good way to uh, involve the community around it. Yes, so this would definitely be like in an open source fashion where anyone could contribute their thing to the landscape. We already have, we already, if you go to uh, something called uh, l.cncf.io, you kind of see what we've done for the, the wider cloud native landscape. Um, it works pretty well because uh, community members tend to police themselves, which is beautiful. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. thing to watch to make sure that things are kind of categorized uh, properly. But it's for us to kind of come up with the categorization scheme. Categorization scheme. Hmm. So, um, yeah, that's yeah, basically all the time I kind of want to spend on this one just because we have demos and I'm really excited to see them. Um, all I ask from the group is to throw some ideas on um, the GitHub issue that I've linked to and we'll kind of go from there and try to do that uh, work stream in an async fashion as, as possible. Cool. All right, uh, so moving on. So uh, next up, we have two community presentations, um, kind of see how people are doing chaos engineering in the wild. So first off, we'll have uh, Eugene from Gremlin um, talk a little bit about what he's up to, and then we'll have Sylvain from, <coughs> uh, to talk about chaos toolkit, but let me stop sharing my screen so Eugene could get going. All right. Cool, thanks Chris. You there, Eugene? Yep, sure thing. Um, actually. Cool. I share that screen and just move over to the uh, okay. slide for now. Yeah, yeah, sure. Give me a second. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah. I'll get going. Sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, God. Here we go. Okay, got it. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. So, uh, hey, uh, my name is Eugene. I've been at Gremlin since July last year. Um, just want to, whoa, is the slide okay? Um, seeing a little bit of artifacts around. Got it. Good now. Cool. Very good. Cool. So the company itself has been founded in 2016. Uh, Colton left at that point in time and you know, recruited Forney to be CTO um, to start working on this product to make chaos engineering available for basically the rest of the world since um, we've all seen it work at places like Google with their debt, uh, dirt exercises at um, Dropbox similarly with Hammy and her dirt exercises and also with Colin at Netflix, chaos engineering, and then Colin with Forney doing uh, you know, uh, chaos engineering, making having, having a tool, uh, it, building a tool internally at Amazon retail. Um, so we know the value at the corporate level. And so we're just trying to make it uh, available to everybody else. Um, Gremlin itself installs in a myriad of ways. One of them is a Linux package. So all you really have to do is pull down our repo um, and then, you know, install it, install the package. Or you can install us as a Docker container. You pull us from uh, gremlin slash gremlin on Docker Hub or as a, K, uh, as a Kubernetes daemon set. So um, I've seen a lot of our customers do that as well. Uh, we have a CLI interface such that you could SSH into any host to run gremlin experiments. Uh, you, we have an API as well for automation as well as a web app just to make it really easy for people to dive into all the types of failure modes that we could introduce into your ecosystem or otherwise just to properly scope your attacks. Um, one of the things that you know, I find uh, very valuable when helping our customers uh, scope out chaos engineering experiments is that they go, you know, where do I start? You go, well, if, if you don't have this nice rich UI to say, to give them all the parameters, it's really hard to get started because, you know, think, oh, I could just blow up a whole auto scaling group on AWS and see what happens, right? Well, start small um, and we could help you scope that out properly. Um, we also have a built-in scheduler. You know, I think uh, one of the things that we all kind of, I, I hear a lot is about automation. And so putting things into the scheduler really helps you maintain that floor of resilience in any of your applications. Um, finally, we also have this halt rollback feature or a dead man switch, where if you think that you're causing a lot of damage and um, you know you really want to stop it from happening, uh, we have a halt button. Just click on it, or otherwise use an API to stop the attack, um, and we'll be able to uh, stop and get back to steady state. Alternatively, if you, just to stop things from go, going wild, and you know your, our client loses control to our control plane. Uh, you can then, we, our demand switch on our client will kick in 
and then roll back to steady state automatically such that you know you don't have any uncontrollable chaos uh, within your ecosystem. So that's it for this slide. Let me go ahead and get into the demo really quickly. Um, let's see. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. Here, I need, I need to stop sharing. So you can sure. Chrome. Cool. Now go for it. You should have you should have permissions now. Cool. Let me know when the screen shows up for everyone. Cool. I can see it. Yeah, it works for me. Fantastic. Yes. So uh, right when you log into our uh, service, this is the UI that you're going to get. If you have clients already hooked up to our control plane, you could already begin to uh, create your first attack. Um, otherwise, put things in the scheduler and finally just to manage our client, your clients or users that's connected to us. Um, I already talked about the way of installation, so I'm not going to usually talk about that with our, with our prospects and customers. So I'll just skip on that and go right into the types of attacks that we could run. Um, right now, the client itself is focused on um, infrastructure level attacks. So things that happen on your host, things that happen on your operating system, things that happen uh, on, on the network, all those things we have a, a good suite of attacks that you could run uh, with Gremlin. So resource attacks, uh, first off, that I'll start off with um, is things that happen on your host, right? We could consume uh, host cores. So the amount of cores that you have on your uh, host or your instance, for example, you can specify the exact amount of hosts that you want. Um, we could specify the amount of disk space you want us to fill, right? Uh, what happens if, your, if, our, if our log rotation doesn't happen? Uh, we internally got bit by Blatt. You should check out our blog post at gremlin.com. <laughs> um, and finally, we could also uh, introduce disk read write activity. For those of you that have a lot of disk intensive tasks, um, this might be a good uh, Gremlin to run if you have um, you know, a lot of high, heavy IO operations. And finally, too, we could also consume gigs of memory. Um, notice that every single one of these attacks, uh, we, you could also save as a template. When you have a, this, uh, some attack that you find that you're going to recall uh, fairly frequently, um, some of these attacks might be a little bit uh, more specific and uh, highly targeted. So as a result of that, uh, the configuration could take a little bit of time. Save it as a template. That way you could bring it back in the future. Or otherwise throw it into the scheduler uh, so that you can then um, just uh, automate that particular attack. State gremlins here alter the state of your operating system. So for example, we have a process killer here where we can string match the process that you send to us and we'll just kill it perpetually. Um, what happens if your web server, like your HTTPD were to go away or your Java or your Tomcat app were to go away? Does Health Check pick that up um, and then I otherwise terminate the host or start recovering from it? Um, good thing to te test with this. We also have a shutdown gremlin. So what happens in say public cloud, right? Like AWS, a failed health check, your instance get, is gonna get terminated. Or meltdown, your uh, AWS would go rolling reboot across your entire fleet. You don't know when it's gonna hit, but it's gonna hit. Uh, use uh, the shutdown gremlin for this. Uh, one of the key values that we have here is that, you know, if you use this in conjunction with our scheduler down here, and you say, oh, run this during business hours, right? Uh, nine to five, we're running the shutdown or reboot gremlin uh, five times a day. Well, you basically then would have that chaos monkey experience right out of the box for yourself uh, right there. The uh, final state gremlin that we have is time travel, where we'll break NTP and introduce clock skew. Uh, many times I hear from our customers that when you introduce this uh, in, say, your Cassandra cluster, terrible things happen. Maybe you want to see what, what happens in, that, in, in your own world for your data layer. Otherwise, things like daylight savings time is also something to consider. A certificate on your host were to expire. Uh, that is a good thing to simulate as well. Or a leap year. Now, the final gremlin set of gremlins that we have are the network ones. And these tend to be the most valuable and most powerful ones because uh, in a distributed system, in, in AWS or any kind of cloud provider, the network tends to be the most fragile point. As you're breaking your uh, applications from monolithic to microservices, your network is now basically part of your application stack, right? You expect it to be high performing, but really some things happen because, well, cloud happens, network uh, devices have built-in entropy to them. Um, definitely want to simulate what happens uh, when things become degraded or otherwise un unavailable. The black hole gremlin here uh, drops all packet going from one place to another. 
So you can simulate something like a full service uh, unavailability. Uh, notice that all these network gremlins have the most amount of uh, arguments that you can pass to it. And I really just want to highlight the co uh, concept right here that we could actually simulate uh, full service outages. Now, some of you might remember this great outage that happened last year called the S3 outage. And uh, we can simulate that for you out of the box just by adding that as, your, um, as, as a service provider right here. The next gremlin that we have is the DNS gremlin, and we could break DNS for you. You want to test what happens if your primary DNS server were to go away. Do your hosts actually do secondary uh, fall or fallbacks to your secondary server? Um, definitely something to worthwhile, uh, worthwhile to check. Otherwise, you can simulate bigger DNS outages like uh, Dyn DNS, right? Or uh, Ultra DNS that happened a few years ago, um, or just maybe Route 53 being unavailable as well. These last two gremlins, latency and packet loss, uh, are the ones that I would call gray states of failure. You know, your systems are, are running, but due to things like noisy neighbor or having to traverse through a lot of internet traffic, uh, things become slow or otherwise degraded. So it's not operating at its most efficient point. Of, uh, point. So the problems usually manifest themselves in the form of latency, right? Things just become a little bit slower than what you're expecting them to be. Um, you've seen the menus here, so I'll just go ahead and talk a little bit about it. Uh, you, dial, you want to dial in how long you want to run, run the attack for. Sometimes your observability or your monitoring tools take a little bit longer for uh, the metrics to show itself. So we definitely, uh, you could definitely specify how long you want to run the attack for. You can specify uh, things at the IP address, IP address range, or CIDR or block level. At the device level, such as your ETH0 or your ETH1, your host name or endpoint, such as if you want to just inject some latency going to google.com, you can do just type it in. Or if you want to do have an external, your service has a third party dependency to something for messaging like Twilio, you can do that as well. If you want to whitelist particular traffic, it's just a um, carrot right here. So maybe you want to whitelist your monitoring just so you could have some observability into this chaos experiment. Uh, we could also support uh, port, port ranges. And finally, you can also specify uh, what protocol you want. Once you're done defining the attack, you now want to specify the targets that you want to attack. And by this, um, we, we're talking about the uh, blast radius, if you will. So to help you with this, we pull down uh, for AWS uh, instance metadata here, where you can click on any of these bubbles to filter by, say, region or availability zone. And finally, we also support uh, services that you can pass on to us as well so that um, you know, you, you, your hosts are serving up a particular application, you can specify that. One of the things that I like to highlight here is, that, is our concept of random. You know, we, uh, while most of the tools that we see say, you know, do random, do it in prod, um, we kind of say you want to still be a little bit targeted. So our concept of random here is that we take all of the clients that you have installed with us and then via filtering, like say, uh, I only care about things like things like our API, for example. It'll then pull and otherwise filter all the clients that are serving that particular service. And then you can then specify, well, I only care about maybe two hosts here. Um, so go ahead and use that as my target. Or otherwise, you can also support a percent of our uh, environment is impacted, right? So maybe I would say 50% of it is Sorry, typo, 50% of it is, is going to get impacted. Now, if you want to do uh, container attacks like in your Kubernetes uh, environment or something along those lines, you could send us your um, labels that you have put in your pods and we'll just go ahead and say, we'll go ahead and attack the matching pods within those hosts. We don't uh, use it right now, so let me just go ahead and just kick off this attack. Once you've done, uh, specify your attack and you kicked it off. It'll take us over to our attacks page where you see all the current attacks and also all historically run attacks. Uh, we are own dog food, so you, you're going to see a lot of attacks in the Gremlin play, for example. Once you click in, uh, you get to see the full attack definition. All client logging comes back up to us so that you don't have to, to remote into a host uh, so to see what's going on. At any given point in time, you feel like, you, again, you've done enough damage or I need to roll this back because I made a mistake and I fat fingered my attack, for example. We have a halt button right here. Our client will pick that up within seconds and go back to steady state within seconds. Um, 
Everything I've shown you, again, full feature parity with our API, right? We don't circumvent ourselves via the web app um, or anything of that sort. So you can go ahead and orchestrate your own tooling um, or otherwise uh, put it into your CI CD pipeline such that you would have your smoke tests, your regression tests, um, well, spin up a canary cluster, install Gremlin, run some resilience tests on it as well to get some uh, confidence in the resilience of your systems. So that's the demo for Gremlin. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. Maybe if there's any questions around uh, that I might be able to answer for everyone. Hi. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is Heyman from India. I work for VMware. I have experience of one year working as a KS engineer. New to the group. I forgot to uh, introduce myself uh, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, you were mentioning that uh, you can write some tests to test to post the Gremlin attack. Uh, is, the, uh, is there any uh, provisioning in Gremlin where I can uh, switch these tests? Where you can, I'm sorry, do what to the test? Uh, can I... Can I uh, run this test through Gremlin? Yes, well, uh, you do run everything through Gremlin because we have the client installed and then you could use us to orchestrate the attack for you. Okay, can you just uh, give it a small demo around it? Uh, yeah, well, please visit gremlin.com. We'd love to speak with you further. Um, just go ahead and request a trial and uh, we'll be on our way. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, well, there's nothing else. Thanks for the time. Hey, uh, just one question. Yep. You're like, uh, I was just curious for the, this is Deepak from uh, Capital One. Um, so for the network uh, disruptions that you talked about, um, uh, are you using um, like a traffic command based shaping? Like, like are you using any TCP libraries? Like uh, what are you using behind the scene? Sure. Um, for Linux, um, if you're familiar with TC, is something similar to that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Most yeah. of uh, the production boxes I've seen like Linux uh, OS is. So I believe, yeah, as long as we have access to run the TC commands, we should be able to achieve that, right? Right. Uh, I'll defer to Forney to talk more about what's under the hood since uh, <laughs> he's the developer <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah. All of our all of our gremlins use like. Core Linux libraries to do the to do the impact. So yeah, if you have the TC library, you're good to go. Okay. Cool. Uh, in most of your demo around the AWS endpoint. Do you support any other remote machines? Where um, if we support Linux and other container environments. So if you uh, run those. Environments, you're good to go. Uh, we currently do not have a Windows environment, for example. Okay. Yep. Can you uh, schedule attacks against like the Kubernetes API, for example? Uh, I am not sure about the Kubernetes API specifically. Mm -hmm. um, Throw me away in here. Yeah, please do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, not against the API right now. We're adding in uh, a yeah. bit more container and, and Kubernetes support. Okay. Uh, originally kind of built for bare metal and mm -hmm. our, or, you know, uh, EC2, that sort of thing. And now we're, we're kind of iterating on that, that build right now. Good question, though. Uh, cool. Thanks. So I, I, I want to get a little bit more detail. Can you share more details about what are you planning around Kubernetes API with Gremlin? Uh, I mean, I can't share exactly what we're planning right at the moment, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to, suffice it to say, there will be better Kubernetes support. How about that? Is there a timeline that can be shared? Not at the moment, no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Are there uh, any plans to integrate uh, with uh, kind of any of the service meshes out there like Istio? or conduit to essentially, as you're doing a slow rollout, also integrate kind of gremlin testing as part of that to ensure things are, are kosher before doing a full rollout. Yeah, it's definitely something we've thought about. Um, you know, if we're, we're sort of just getting past the POC stage right here. So in okay. terms of 
things we want to do, you know, and it's okay. sort of figuring out where, where the, uh, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease sort of thing. So containerization has been a real big part of, you know, our past uh, roadmap. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you go into a little bit of the telemetry that you get after you've run an experiment? I see like there were some logs on your dashboards. Do you get any sort of visualizations or anything like that? So right now, uh, we primarily, we've kind of like opted to stay away from integrating with monitoring just because it gets a little hairier when you start to take some of that information. Uh, plus there are a lot of great monitoring solutions out there. So we tend to leave these sort of things to Lightstep and uh, Datadog, uh, those sort of things. I'm sure, you know, there's opportunities to expand into that space in the future. Um, it's just not been, since it's not sort of our, our core competency, we've, we've sort of let the, them do their thing and, you know, let things kind of line up in the monitoring dashboards. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. sure. Cool. Uh, my question was actually centered around uh, monitoring as well. So um, how do you guys interface or do you interface at all with uh, things that are tracking like SLOs, SLAs um, mm -hmm. to like make them put them on like a quiet mode or like, would you even want that? Um, and like kind of sub note, I'm new to this. So uh, maybe that is something that you want to see if your SLAs are affected by such a thing. I mean, it's a fantastic question. Um, since we kind of stayed away and it, it's kind of hard to do, I guess, SLO and SLA definition generically. A lot of companies do them kind of differently. We've, we've sort of not integrated into that space just yet. Uh, by well, and, that's, and that's fine. Like I heard about your core, your, statement on core competency, I think that's great. But uh, like being able to tie into something like Prometheus or uh, and like maybe making it so it's not gonna go page like an entire engineering team while you're doing tests like this, maybe at least in a controlled setting, but. Yeah, no, you're totally right. Uh, I guess what we sort of, um, what we usually tend to advocate is over communication in that regard. So if sure. somebody does get paged, they know that they're getting paged because there's, we're running testing. Uh, obviously, yeah, you can turn off your paging, right? You can turn off uh, whatever page or duty or silence these sort of things. Um, oftentimes, though, actually, we, we want to do this to see that a page actually goes off when something bad happens, right? So if you peg a bunch of cores, you expect pages to go off. So it's kind of like unit testing your paging and, and, and uh, I don't know, just the idea of, of making sure that your on-call knows what to do, testing engagement, spinning new people up. It's, you can do it either way, right? That's a fair point. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Right. I definitely have to agree with Forney on this point. Uh, many times when I run game days with our customers, it's not so much finding bugs with them, but more so making sure that they have their observability, their monitoring, their paging dialed in tune. And, you know, a lot of times when they go, this happened, I never got a page for it. Yeah, you follow the heroes real quickly to get that dialed in, guy. Um, otherwise, it's going to be, this is already in production. <laughs> Okay, cool. I have another question. Oh, sure. One more question. Go ahead, Chris. No, no, I'm just saying one more question, Arun, and then uh, just to be sensitive of time until Sivain's presentation. Go, go ahead, okay. ask your question. Yeah, so, um, um, I would like to find out if there is any integration with CloudWatch events. Like, let's say if my auto scaling group is going up and down too fast. You now, is there any integration with Gremlin where you could trigger some tests to give me some more details about it? Uh, go ahead, Forney. I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question entirely. Um, I mean, if you want to trigger your ASC cycling pretty quickly, like you can just use kit, like you can use the shutdown gremlin on loop, I, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure that there's like a direct integration in terms of CloudWatch events. I'm not sure like what, I'm not sure what your hypothesis is here that you're trying to uh, accept or disprove, I suppose. So let me ask differently, you know, is, has any customer asked for integration with CloudWatch events, particularly in the AWS land, because that's where sort of my state of my cluster, all the events, et cetera, are thrown. Sure, people have asked. People, people I, I don't know if you know engineers, they ask for everything. They ask for everything under the sun. Um, yeah, it's, it's been asked. Um, you know, we're slowly rolling out more integrations and sort of prioritizing what our customers ask. They definitely ask for that. They definitely ask for other, other sort of things as well. Sorry, I can't be more specific. No, no okay. that's good, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Okay, cool. Uh, I just wanna make sure that uh, we're sensitive to, to time, but uh, thank you, Eugene and Matthew, for uh, uh, the presentation. That was, that was super cool. 
All right. Uh, so uh, but we've got about 20 minutes left. So it's about 15 minutes for Sylvain to present with some five minutes for questions. So Sylvain, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah. Awesome. If you can uh, put the slides as well as, um, as you did for Eugene, that'd be nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to go find that uh, right now. Give me a sec. I'm afraid Ooh. things won't look as... Um, no, no worries. As, uh, as, as they did for Gremlin. <laughs> no, no, it's Still different. I am not that very glamorous. <laughs> different tools. Uh, okay, so uh, hopefully you see everything. Oh, yeah, so, um, so hello everyone. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about the Chaos Toolkit, uh, an open source effort that Russ Miles and I have started about in September, I think, last year. Uh, the, the idea was roughly that uh, we saw that tools like Remlin, Pumba, or, you know, Chaos Monkey, obviously, uh, were there. But as we, we were trying to figure out how to apply uh, the experimental pot pattern that we, we had read about in the Chaos Engineering book, we felt that those tools, while actually delivering the, the good, weren't helping us uh, forging the experiment, if you will. So we decided to create the Chaos Toolkit to do that, basically. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> So the Chaos Toolkit does, by itself, does nothing like Gremlin does or others. What it does is it helps you declare your experiment and then you decide how do you want to drive, what tool or what API you want to drive to actually inject Chaos. So the Chaos Toolkit wouldn't actually provide anything much, uh, like Gremlin, but does actually drive the API if you wish to, to use uh, Gremlin for, for that matter. So basically, you, it's just uh, an open API for your experiment, if you will. Um, it's a CLI, CLI driven. Uh, we felt like we wanted something we could automate that way. That's why we didn't care for uh, UI at first um, or initially. A target simplicity, I'm talking about the code itself. Uh, well, we wanted something that other people could actually uh, contribute to. And we tried hard to actually make things as, as simple as we could. Uh, so it basically, it's just a bunch of functions uh, glued together in Python. Um, well, it's a bit more than that, but that's that rough idea. If you want to contribute, just, you know, you, you do need to know Python to very basic level. Uh, what it does, it orchestrates uh, existing tools or API. Uh, by existing tools, that means that if you have a, a binary that you want to drive from the Chaos Toolkit, you can call it. But if, equally, if you want to call an API, you can also you know, just call it by passing all the parameters the API requires, and simply it will call that for you. Um, the, we already actually implemented a set of drivers. We call them drivers, but you know, they're just extensions to Chaos Toolkit, really. Um, we, we don't claim we support all the API of, of those providers. That would be foolish and you know, just a lie. But we try to target um, API that people don't necessarily trigger very much, like yeah, stop a service or stop, you know, remove, remove just a Kubernetes service or things like that. Basically anything that you probably don't call except if you're a developer and you do that on a daily basis, but without the idea of a chaos engineering in mind, you're just, you know, stopping something to restart after that. Well, those APIs are very powerful in, in production or pre-prod or wherever you want to run them to actually impact your system, if you will. So for, for example, if you want to remove a service or if you want to terminate a pod, just call, you know, delete pod, basically that's it. Uh, if you want to destroy a pod, that's different. But if you gracefully, you just want to stop something, you can do it with Kubernetes. And we started to implement things, you know, like that for all sorts of providers. Uh, Azure with Service Fabric is a bit different because they already actually uh, have Chaos services native to the, to the platform. So you don't actually call, you just call start, you know, start Chaos or stop Chaos. Much like Istio, I think, which has a fault injection. And when we realize, well, you know, causing trouble is fine, but we really need some probes as well. Uh, like, um, like you guys said earlier about um, calling your monitoring tool is fantastic, but we want it during the experiment to be able to collect the data that matter to us in that regard of, of the experiment so that you can support your analysis after that. So we have probes, uh, basically we call, we query, you can query Prometheus or Umeo if you use that as a central logging platform. 
Uh, and that basically all that is contained in the file that I'll show you in a minute. We got a bunch of plugins for creating reports and sending Slack notifications. And finally, the future of, of Chaos Toolkit is we're going to go more native in Kubernetes with cron job so that you can schedule things and just run, let, let them run. Uh, we're looking at operators as well uh, to actually control a bit more the experiments when you run natively into Kubernetes, but that's just you know, starting to think about that. Uh, and drivers in other runtimes. Um, we run in, in Python and we are not, you know, we're not, you know, we love everything. So if you want to run your, you know, your extensions in Go or Rust or anything, we're going to try to make it easy to actually call it from uh, the Chaos Toolkit as best as we can. And we are trying to aim for milestone, you know, one this year at some point. So that's it for a very quick review of, of Chaos Toolkit. Uh, it's open source, it's uh, Apache license. And now I'm going to try to demo something. <laughs> if cool. the demo gods are with me. One second, I will, uh, I will yeah. exit and so you could share your screen. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, right. Indeed. Share my screen. Should All be right. good to go. Yes. Let's, let's pick that one. Right, uh, so that's a website. Uh, we, like I said, it's a CLI driven, so <laughs> nothing very fancy to show here. Um, the idea is, is just to, to walk th through the, the important bits. Uh, like I said, we try to, uh, to create an open API. Uh, so the open API is, you know, it's, uh, it's just a definition of the various elements of, of, um, of a chaos experiment. That's what it looks like, you know, briefly. You've got a set of metadata, blah, blah, blah. Um, what's interesting is you've got the steady state uh, here, what, what, you know, what the normal in your system. So what we do is that is we use a bunch of probes, you can have as many as you want, to query for some things in your system. And what we're going to do is if any of them fails the tolerance, here it's just a Boolean, it could be something else, uh, we bail the experiment. Because in our mind, if your system is not normal, at least in, your, you know, in what you expect to be normal, then there's no point actually in going through to cause trouble because you won't be able to read, analyze, and make sense of what you, you see. So we bail immediately. But we run that steady state hypothesis at the end again, once we've caused trouble, to see if we deviate it. If that passes again, now that means two things. Either you ask the wrong questions, or you found a potential you know, weakness. So at that stage, what you want to do is basically go into the report and see what, 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 you know, what happened and make sense of it as a team. Now you've got the method. So once you've, got the, you've run the steady state once, uh, the hypothesis, you run the method and just it's a bunch of actions or probes. Uh, usually you've got one or two actions because you want to make sense of what's happening. So if you change too many things, uh, I guess it's similar to what Gremlin is doing. You can't create attacks, I suppose. You try not to create attacks that conflict each other, otherwise it's probably much harder to actually make sense of what's happening. And then you've got rollbacks. We, we tend to call them remediation uh, these days because to us rollbacks are strong promise that you can come back to normal state, which is not always the case if you've already broken your system. But the idea is, is sometimes you want to come back to you know, steady state. Now with Kubernetes, usually rollbacks are empty because Kubernetes is meant to actually support and deal with you know, failures automatically. So you don't actually do anything there. Right, uh, so that's it. It's a JSON file that is declarative. And what happens is you define your probe actions. They all have the same format. So let's pick that one. Um, it's a provider, it's in Python, it takes that module and that function. In this case, it doesn't actually have any parameters or arguments. In this one, you can actually specify the name or the label, you know, things like that. They are just functions basically in the Python module somewhere. But you declare them and you can share them on GitHub and you can, you know, basically see the, the we, we wanted to have something on file so that you can really use that inside your CI CD pipeline as usual. It's just another source thing. Like, a, although I, I'm trying to not sound like a test, it certainly you know overlaps with the testing you know tooling in in, uh, in some fashion. Uh, and you can have you know reference existing props if, so that you don't have to actually duplicate things. 
Uh, sometimes we do have a pose. Uh, I personally dislike that, but I couldn't see any other fas fashion except if I was doing synchronization with the system telling me how it was you know, doing. So sometimes it's a bit flaky, that thing. So, you know, contributions are very welcome to actually improve the, the, the API definitely. All right, um, let's try to sh show an experiment here. So we're going to use a very stupid demo. Uh, we've got that application, which is this one does nothing. That data that you see here is pulled from a Postgres database. And what we want to see is um, under some medium load, can we actually kill what happens if the database master actually dies? And behind the scene on Kubernetes, what we're using is Patroni from Zalando, which as a leader and follower for Postgres and will should switch from one to the other if the master dies. And that's what we want to prove because we, we expect that if the master dies, we don't actually impact our users. So let's see how it looks actually. That probably it's more interesting. That's not the one I want. Right, can you see that? I'm not sure I'm, I'm you know, zoomed enough. So please you know, do tell me if, if not. Yes, um, all right, sweet. Uh, so <clears throat> what we have, it's exactly the same what I showed you before. We select you know, the application that we're interested in. That's, we check that the pod is alive, the application must re, you know, does respond. And if that does happen, if that doesn't happen, the, you know, the, 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 ex the experiment bails immediately. Otherwise, it goes to the method. And here, what we do is we terminate the DB master. And we don't have actually a function doing that. What we do is we terminate the pod, the pod that has that label. And luckily enough, we only have one. It's a demo, blah, blah, blah. Uh, round is here means nothing because, again, we have only one that matches that label. But if you had many, it would actually you know, pick one uh, through, that, through that argument. And then we've got a bunch of probes. Now you might wonder why I'm, you know, picking, you know, going and fetch the logs. During the experiment, doesn't actually do anything. Does anything? But it's interesting why when you do the analysis, because you can come back and look at if you had the logs that you were, you know, looking for in your application or, you know, in your various parts of the system. So for your analysis, sometimes it's nice to actually go and fetch them as you run the experiment. And that's basically it. So oh, let's pray that uh, this works. So you just run chaos is the command that you're going to run. I don't know if you see that, but there is a notification on the top right because we send that to Slack saying it started. Uh, and it basically doesn't do much. It runs things in order that, you know, it reads them from the file. Um, and that's why it, it does look like a test because <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Um, in this case, it should fail if I'm, if I'm correct, because the application will collapse. There you go. So here, the reason it fails, what, so what's interesting here is we see that first it did, it did succeed. So the system was normal. So we went on and killed the DB master, but it failed when we run that again. And the reason is because in, my, in that specific case, my code was not good enough to actually uh, reconnect, if you will, to the new data, database master. So when I called the application, it failed because the connection at that stage was was tall. So what we want to do, and you know, if you had a CD, what you do is you'd map probably that uh, to a fix, and then you'd push that to, you could use weave or something like that to say, well, okay, I, I fixed the thing now. So I'm going to release the fix, apply the, the fix, Let's wait for it to come back. Come on. There you go, it's already there. And now we're going to run that. Uh, what I did, but I, uh, I don't have that set up right, you know, properly. Oops, <laughs> it's not set up yet. It's not up yet. So in that case, actually, what you saw is the, the um, steady state bailed the experiment initially because the system was not normal. I went too fast and probably the system was not yet ready. Oh, it's, it is now. There you go. Um, but what you do is probably you hook up that with Git, you know, Git cube or whatever, and say, well, okay, I've released the fix, rerun that, you know, all those things that you know you would do with any sort of test, basically. And hopefully that fix does, you know, 
does work and you've proven you had a weakness and you found it, you fixed it and you try it again. And that's the before and after that you would want to, to see from chaos engineering experiments. Now, there you go. It, it, you know, it shows that the steady state now is met. So that means our, our application now is, is able to actually sustain that kind of, of loss. You know, if the master goes away and the connection is lost, we are able to actually sustain that, that error. Uh, that's a kind of, you know, the failure that you won't want to see. That's a basic one. And if I have time, I don't know, um, perhaps not, but there is another one I would, I would want, you know, I would want to show you. Um, I'll, uh, I'll stop now, but I, I don't think I have yeah. the time. Would be if you, let's say you have, um, your, you're using, you know, GKE or something like that, and you realize one of your nodes, the virtual machine is actually, um, uh, I don't know, security, a security issue or something. What you want to, to, to do is, 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 you know, pull out a new node pool, right? New set of machines with a fix. But you want to see whether or not it's going to impact your users to switch from a, one node to another node. Well, that's an experiment you can run with a Chaos Toolkit. You're going to bring a new node pool with new machines, Bring that to Kubernetes, see the load spread from one cluster to the other side of the, of the node pool, and see if your application is actually impacted. That's the kind of thing you can do with, with the Chaos Toolkit because we, all we do is we drive existing APIs. We don't try to create new sort of Chaos you know, uh, tooling because already they already exist and in, in various fashions like that. Right, that was my demo. <laughs> cool, thank, thank you. We have uh, about five minutes for questions. Anyone have any questions? I actually had one. Yeah. Um, I yeah. saw when it got to the end of the run, it said like, let's roll back, no rollbacks declared. I'm curious like what the rollback would end up looking like for, and maybe an experiment like this doesn't have one, but I guess what does the JSON body of that end up looking like? Uh, so yeah, it's a good question. Um, the why in, in steady state we use probes only. In rollbacks, you can use actions. Basically all you do is you try to revert something. So for example, if I had the time to show you the, the node pool one, I actually delete, I create a node pool. So it's just a bunch of virtual machines really. And, and while I, that runs, I, I killed the node pool in the rollbacks. Uh, but in, in the, the example I showed you, because I'm using Kubernetes, Kubernetes take care of, of the rollback, if you will. <laughs> yeah, they don't reboot the pods. I, yeah, I killed, yeah, I killed the DB master, but uh, patch running with the operator and, and Kubernetes make sure that it comes back to life. So yeah, in Kubernetes, actually rollbacks are, I wouldn't say meaningless, but certainly yes, less useful. <laughs> cool. yeah. Awesome, thank you. Thanks. Any other uh, questions? Otherwise, um, I will ask for volunteers to present at the next meeting I know. Um, Paul has volunteered to talk about his uh, work on Spring, and maybe um, uh, Miko, Powerful Seal, sometime. Any other volunteers to present next? Uh, yeah, Chris, I can demo the LinkedIn stuff. Okay. Uh, we've done. Obviously, it's all private, but um, it okay. still shows us uh, some of the techniques. Pretty cool, and actually probably builds on some of that Spring work as well. Um, yeah, just, okay, just... I, I can also demo the, the Pumba, but again, maybe next, not next meeting, since we already have enough presentation yep. in a week, uh, meeting after that. Like yeah, yeah, I, I just want to collect the backlog of things and I'll just schedule you. I'll try to do w at least one presentation a meeting uh, to Max. So. Okay, cool. so write me. Thanks. I'll write you on the backlog, thanks. Any other volunteers? Cool. All right, well, that, that's good for now. Uh, so we have a couple uh, minutes left, so just wanna be sensitive to people's time. So thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, I wanna you know, continue to do all the white paper uh, and landscape work as async as possible. Um, hopefully people could give their input on that while we kind of build that out. Um, I think other than that, that's, that's it. Anyone else have anything to say? Otherwise, we could thank our presenters and meet again in a couple of weeks. Do you, uh, do you have a timeline in mind for the white paper and landscape? Uh, <laughs> um, I'm 
I know. Really bold question. I'm just, I'm curious. Yeah. So like, uh, I, I love forcing functions. So like picking a date and like hammering towards it generally works well. Um, I, I think it's going to take, a, there's, it's going to take still some consensus building, but I would love to get something out probably in, in a one to two month time frame. It's cool. going to, we're also going to have to give my designers on the CNCF side about two weeks to kind of make things uh, pretty and kind of professional and line up PR and all that stuff. So whatever we choose, we'll have to at least have a two week buffer for them to, to do that work. Yeah, it sounds great. I was just trying to get a general feel. Yeah. So awesome. hey, cool. All righty. Let's do it. Let's do it. Great. Thanks. See you in a couple weeks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.